Hello, my name is Sharmila Beesbohan, and I'm part of Speaking Volumes Live Literature Productions, along with Sarah Sanders and Nick Chapman. We're delighted to be celebrating 10 years of Speaking Volumes this year, and as part of that, we've got a brand new anthology called Not Quite Right For Us, which is published by Flip Eye Publishing. Tonight we're going to be talking on the theme of childhood with some of the authors from the book, and you'll also hear readings on childhood from Jay Bernard, Afshan D'Souza Lodi, John Hegley, Catherine Johnson, and Zhao Lu Go. We really hope you enjoy this film. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone joining us today to talk about childhood, which is in the Not Quite Right for Us anthology. Um, I'd like to start by asking all of you a little to tell us a little bit about where you grew up, when you grew up, just to kick off. Um, I grew up in 1970s London, little a couple of years in Guyana and a couple of years in Calgary in Canada. And um, yes, that was a time of massive change in terms of my accent changed every time I moved. And the one thing that didn't really change was racism that I experienced everywhere. But um, there are also many good times. So why don't we start with you, John? Why don't you tell us where you grew up and um, what you experienced? I was born in London, in North London, where I'm back now. And I moved to Luton um, when my sister was born because we couldn't afford a three bedroom place in London. And I was schooled in Luton. Um, and the school I'm going to talk about was my secondary school, which um, I wasn't as happy in my secondary school as I was in my primary school. I had Sisters of the Holy Ghost taught me in my first school, and I really liked them. And I liked the holiness, and I, f I fitted in. But when I went to the other school, basically the others grew up fast, and I was growing up slowly. So I didn't really, I wasn't really keeping up with them. And I was ju just thinking about the amount of books that I've got now, I mean, we only had a tiny amount of those books. And I, I think I, I had a smaller knowledge of the world in those days, and maybe than some of the other children in my school. What about you, Catherine? Where, where did you grow up and what was it like for you? Um, I grew up in North London and I was born in 1962, so 60s and 70s. And... Uh, we were always in the same house. We, I, I, I mean, until my parents left London um, and that, by which time I'd left, but I did spend a lot of time because my mum was a teacher. We spent a lot of the holidays with her family in North Wales. My dad's family's from Jamaica, but obviously it's so expensive for a family of four to go there. I think we went there once in my childhood, but we did have relatives. We had people coming through the house. We had lodgers from everywhere, from East Africa, West Africa, Eastern Europe. And so we had, it was like having, you know, we, we were a bit of the world in the house, except in North Wales, my grandparents were monoglot Welsh and a lot of my family were complete Welsh speakers, but everybody knew who I was, which was sort of good in a way. And there was, I don't know. I think my, my childhood up to primary school seems pretty golden now. I, again, I, like John, I hated secondary school. It was like it's the beginning of the end. I peaked too early. But um, yeah, I, I think on the whole, even though there were a lot of bad things, I, I look upon it as lovely now. I'm not a child. I know what you mean, though, um, Catherine, because my mum was a nurse and loads of people recognised her. And um, because of that, my sister and I were always being 
asked, oh, are you Sister Biesmahan's daughters? And we wouldn't have a clue who these people were, but it was quite disconcerting. You couldn't do anything a bit, you know, naughty or be swearing or something without somebody knowing. <laughs> so I totally get it. Um, Jay, tell us a bit about where you grew up and what that was like. I was born in, in London as well. I was born in St Thomas's Hospital. Um, an area I still frequent and I, I kind of, I'm kind of grateful for that actually. Um, I grew up initially um, on Brixton Hill. Um, then when I was six we moved to Croydon. I was part of a, what, what I would describe as a sort of shift of a lot of sort of black and Asian families out of the inner city to the suburbs to have bigger houses, better schools, gardens, that kind of thing. Um, and I would say that I had a very typical um, sort of Caribbean family, um, lots and lots of cousins and relatives and aunts and uncles and all of this. Um, one side of my family was more Rastafarian, um, much more kind of like politically engaged. And then the other side of my family were kind of down the line Anglican, um, Church of England Christians. So I sort of grew up with these kind of two perspectives, um, but I myself was, of course, a weirdo, queer kid in giant grunge trousers listening to Radiohead uh, at my comprehensive school. Um, and I lived there until I was uh, 18 when I left. Afshan, tell us a bit about your upbringing. Um, yeah, so I was born in the early 90s in Dubai. Um, and until I was about four or five years old, we were moving around a lot uh, between India, Pakistan and Dubai. So my mum's um, Catholic Indian, dad uh, Muslim, Muslim Pakistani, um, and then moved straight into Manchester. Um, and I guess I sort of resonate with what you were saying, Shamila, about the, the languages and accents, because I think even now, <laughs> though I've lived in Manchester most of my life, I pride myself in not sounding Mancunian. I don't know. Um, but I pick up accents really well and they shift quite quickly and easily without me realizing it. Um, in, in terms of like schooling, it was, I guess it was really hard because I switched schools quite a lot as, as a kid um, until I got to, um, I think it was like nine and I got to a primary school and I stayed there until um, the end. Um, so making friends was quite difficult and I spent a lot of my time um, arguing for my existence in a space, whether it's Pakistani space, you know, not being Pakistani enough or not being Muslim enough or not being uh, British enough. So I kind of was struggling with that um, so much so that I never really had a chance to fully explore my identity, I think, until I got to university. Yeah. I should actually add to all of this that I was born a Cockney, as you can all tell by my Cockney rhyming slang that I'm using all this time. Um, my mother had got sent to the old Charing Cross Hospital when I was when she was expecting me so um, I have that dubious honour as well which um, I, you know I keep trying to get the pearly suit but it's not quite happened for me yet <laughs> but um, moving on um, to look at your pieces in the book um, I noticed that um, Jay and John both have a, a sort of focus on schooling and John, you mentioned the, the school that you were maybe talking about in your poem. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write that particular story and include it in Not Quite Right for Us. Um, the story came out of, I was thinking of my Luton bungalow that I was brought up in. And um, I'd done a drawing of it and I'd written a lot of things about the draw things in the drawing of the living room. But then I thought, well, I'm going to go and open some of the cupboards and drawers and find things. And um, I found in the wardrobe uh, in the bedroom I shared with my brother, um, my brother's suits. And I remembered that I'd I wore one of them to the school discotheque. Um, and I thought, well, that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, see what see what comes of writing about that, and um, I mean, it's, it's just almost a symbol of not measuring up because I was too I was too small for that suit, and probably a stupid idea to wear it in. And then I saw that there was the boy wearing a t-shirt, and I thought, oh dear, this is wrong. 
and um and then i didn't and then i uh, danced uh, and, and it didn't work out but it was it, it was good to write this as a sort of um kind of lay into rest of that really of sort of making a success out of it in a way by writing a song about it out of mind not fitting in not measuring up making something good out of it um and then also seeing what good there was there anyway like the the fact that my sister even though i thought i hadn't done very well but when i saw my sister she thought she thought I had to, I was I was big to her you know I was little in that environment but at home I was big stuff and um so it was good to look for that and then for the little pockets of humor that are there to find those um it's a kind of sublimating of it it's a kind of of that experience that was a negative experience I wanted to make it positive and so I submit how come this is in the collection Charmilla you'll remember I sent you three poems and one of them I wrote specially, one of them I'd half written before, you rejected both of those, <laughs> and it was you that chose this. I think um, as I felt with both the school poems, yours and Jay's, is that there's not a time when every single person has felt that we you know, didn't fit in at school at some stage, whether that was not being chosen for the netball team or, you know, um, having the wrong colour shoes. We had a really strict school rules policy at our school and I got hauled up once for having grey shoes, which are like the most dull shoes you could ever imagine. But um, so I think that's why it really resonated with me, John. Um, I felt that it, we all had that experience. <laughs> My brother's suit's too big for me. It smells of cigarette smoke so. But I decide to step inside and risk my first school disco. You'll be there and I will dare to share with you my disco fever. On my arrival, Thompson's in a t-shirt and looking round I clearly see oversized formality. There's not the way to be tonight There's not another brother's suit in sight I can't recall exactly just how awkward is my asking you to dance I remember how reluctantly you joined me on the dance floor It's more of a scuffle than a dance So I go and blow my disco charm then there is the raffle, the announcement of the winner of the two Bob Lucky voucher to spend at the tuck shop counter. I call out, hey, that winning number's mine. There isn't any cheering when I do. I fear I will hear Thompson going boo. I wanted to assign you a swig of my pop and the option of a Winning crunchy bar At least I have the sense to see Eyes that are not there for me That do not drink complicity My brother's suit's too big for me And upstairs on the bus on my way home I eat up all those sweeties Feeling bitter to the bone I consume those crunchies on my own Off the bus when I get back Before the suit is on the rack My little sister wants to know How did it go Down the disco I slacken in an armchair I give it a few moments And I say You see this raffle ticket She sees the raffle ticket And I say you're looking at a winner, by the way. Um, Jay, what about you? Your poems are more about how school has impacted even on adult life. Um, so tell us a bit more about 
the series of poems that you wrote? Yeah, whenever I get um, this sort of theme of, of not fitting in, I'm always really torn because my experience has always been kind of double. And particularly at school, I was always very academically able and therefore in many ways respected. Um, funnily enough, I think a lot, of, a lot of kids who are academically able often find themselves not respected, but actually I, I was in both my schools. Um, but socially, a bit weird, a bit off. But I was also really good at fighting and a fast runner. And I also held horrible beliefs, ideas, opinions that I'm partly ashamed to admit now. So when I think about the title and the brief, I also can't help but think about the ways in which I alienated others and the ways in which I did that to deal with my own sense of alienation as well. Um, and school is obviously a hotbed for that kind of alienation because you've got a thousand teenagers in this horrible, sweaty, hormonal soup. Um, and there's no, I, I mean, I don't know about school now, but when I was at school, which was from the uh, well, sort of late 90s, I went, started secondary school in 1999 through to the early 2000s, there was never any mention whatsoever of uh, emotional literacy, of class, of why people were different. So I really wanted to address that. I wanted to not only focus on the ways in which I was alienated, but to focus on the ways in which I um, had this struggle with this, this girl in my school who I can only really describe as, you know, a genuine outcast. Like if she was gonna write, you know, for this brief, I think her purpose would speak to a very, very specific experience of outsideness and alienation that mine was, I think, different to and in contrast to. Um, and how that haunts me now. Um, I believe that that experience and that reconciling of like my own ideas and my own kind of like behavior towards that girl makes me understand difference and isolation and outsiderness. Yeah, in a, in a much more kind of complex and nuanced way now. If you're a person of colour at school in Britain, um, even today, I think that unless you're at one of those schools where there's a majority of kids who are, you know, from different places or different heritages, I think that practically all of us have experienced that kind of um, alienation. But like, I was actually academically bright, but that was a reason to hide because kids were picked on all the time if they were bright. So um, I tried to make myself as invisible as possible, which isn't that easy when you're one of five kids of colour in a, you know, 125 kids in your year. But somehow I managed it. And it's, yeah, it's a really interesting thing how it still haunts you as an adult, that kind of aspect of what you went through. History. What causes me to type your name? It's late, and I am three beers in when you appear. A genie at the search terms. You plus London, your last name plus dead. You plus our old school. Now I know of time as tin opener. Cuts in circles, leaves a hinge. The grey waters that we pour away. Had someone thought to teach a class on love, I might know you. Geography. We sometimes walk the back way home past my house so I could shake you off. Right now, I want to make this the story of two working class kids, but there are degrees to work and class. And I am pissed off with or ashamed by the two up, two down fantasy, when the truth is that after Pokemon, I'd kick you out because if my mother met you, like the time when we got to your door and your mother dragged you in by the neck. Where in the curriculum 
does it say what a child should do next? Drama. No longer hungry, I stand up in the dining hall and offer my meal to the poorest student in my class. Music. Between Googles, I watch compilation videos of top 10 worst auditions for X Factor. I don't find it funny just compelling like folk art. Almost all of them are mentally ill in one way or another and all of, almost all of them confess this right away in their teeth, their shitty style, their choice of song, and most of them are poor. The interesting bit is when they're done and Simon asks, what was that? And they say they might not be the best singer now, but they've got potential. I don't think many of them are looking for fame really, but want to be taken on, fed, trained, blow dried like a Pomeranian, but they've bit their nails to porridge, their feet sweat through their shoes. And Simon says, you can't sing, just as I once told a girl in my class that she would amount to nothing. And in the heat that ensues, their argument is less whether they can reach the crescendo of I will always love you, but if someone treated them nicely, they could. PSHE. I was sent an email once by someone explaining that they would not help me because I was flaky, inconsistent, rude, non-collegiate, unworthy of anything I had. He too was from Clarendon, my old ancestral land, and for a second I feared the Old Testament God, who still reigns there, had reversed my salvation. I was extremely surprised, amazed and even dumbfounded, to be very honest, against my own will. I found myself wondering how you could be working there, and more astonishingly, keeping the position. But so far, you seem to be doing well there, so my warmest congratulations. The world tells you everything that will happen. I knew then what I know now. The heart has a tendency to plump in advance of a laceration. Dance. Walking home through Spitalfields, a man shakes his bucket for mental health. I have no cash, so I refuse. He doesn't care about the change. He seems to know what I have done. You people are unbearable, you know that? You people around here are unbearable. Shen, what you talk about in your um, piece is about how music marked you out, your love of certain types of music marked you out as odd in some way. Um, tell us about why you, you're confessing all of this to your parents and the world at large now. I guess when I when I think about um, music actually and, and school, just, just going off of what you said, Jay, um, my earliest memory is being really bright and not being... Um, pop culture bright. So I had no idea who um, any of the musicians or bands were. And obviously when you know, you're know you growing up in the 90s and you don't know S Club 7 um, or all the members of the bus, like Busted, you're, you're kind of like shunned, or I was anyway. Um, I remember somebody giving me a Busted magazine that had like, um, and it was a ripped out um, page of all like urban slang words that I was supposed to like memorize to fit into like the kids so when I think about like trying to fit in and you know that's a, a really vivid memory um and I guess my entire life music has been um, a solitary experience um and I kind of was, was thinking about why that is um a couple of years back I moved I didn't move into my own place um in, into a house and finally started to love playing music out loud but that means that when somebody's around they hear the music that you're playing and they're curious as to like why you have Cavalli music next to like metal next to like Bollywood next to rap next to Afrobeats they're like what's going on what what sort of music do you listen to and I'm like I don't know I just listen to what I listen to um and I've got family that live with me at the moment so part of this essay, I think, is for them to kind of see the journey that I've come through and understand why, you know, six o'clock in the morning when I'm making breakfast, I need to listen to Marilyn Manson. Um, or maybe not anymore Marilyn Manson, a little bit terrible. Maybe Rammstein, maybe not even Rammstein. This is the thing, there's so many problematic musicians at the moment. Um, it, it's a sort of explanation for them, I think, to sort of piece together my complex identity, because even I'm still, piecing it together and trying to work out who I like and who I don't like music wise. And um, yeah, I think there's so much of our identities that's linked to our memories with music. Um, I know that, you know, when people hear music, they're triggered with 
particular people or with particular memories. And that for me is really, um, I think that's something that I really use a lot in my writing in terms of how I write and how I process things. Um, so yeah, this is mainly for my auntie and uncle that are living with me at the moment um, to pick up the book and read the essay. Yeah. <laughs> This year is the second year in my life that I'm sporting an undercut, a type of hairstyle that features shaving a large portion of your head. Because the shaved part of the head is usually the underlayer near the nape of the neck or to one side, it's pretty easy to hide with long hair. And that's exactly what I've done, hidden it. From my mum, from the nosy aunties who stalk my Instagram and the uncles who hang about the meat shop. It's really silly to think that I meticulously shaved or rather strong-armed my friend into meticulously shaving the underside of my head, only for me to spend most of my time with my hair down, hiding the shave part. I just know that in Manchester in 2020, we this is haven't reached a point where we can sport a shaved or even partially shaved hairstyle. I wasn't always like this, a wannabe rocker. There was a moment when I could have been identified as an uncool freshie. I was 13 when my dad gave me an mp3 player. He told me it was like an iPod, but better. This one had speakers attached to it so that when you took the headphones out, you could blast your music. Who needed headphone splitters? Now, here I could go into detail about a certain incident, but honestly, it still makes me nauseous. All I'll say is that it involved my high school crush, a public bus, some cringe Bollywood music, and the not an iPod MP3 player. That was the last time I used it. But it was also the first time I used LimeWire to download the most recent edition of Now That's What I Call Music. <laughs> Never again would I be caught listening to high-pitched tones over tabla beats in public. I wasn't old enough or politically aware enough to understand the term assimilation, but in hindsight, that's what it was. I did not want to be singled out for being different. I was already one of only two hijabis in the school and the other one was much cooler than me. I remember the first time I listened to rock music. My friend Charlotte burnt me a mixtape of some CDs titled Songs to Get Angry To, featuring rock and heavy metal. This is how I was introduced to Nirvana, Linkin Park, Red, Jutes, Red Jumpsuit Apparatus, Blink 182, Papa Roach and Blue October. From there it was a short jump to Five Finger Death Punch and Rammstein. This music made me angry, made me want to scream, but in a cathartic way. I felt safe and protected, even while listening to it. Eventually, my ringtones would be replaced with heavy guitar strumming, and I'd wake up to I Choose Death before Dishonor and start my day. I used to wonder if people could hear the screaming through my headphones. Luckily for me, my hijab style back then consisted of wrapping thick material round and round my head, pretty tightly creating a soundproofing effect. I don't think I'd ever thought too deeply about the lyrics. I just really liked how I could zone out to the noise. This is a complete contrast to the Bollywood music I'd grown up listening to. Pretty soon my wardrobe began to change too. Leather jackets, new rocks on my feet, I even invested in some chains for my hijab. I was determined to look the part and fit in. The first concert I went to was Rammstein. I got all kitted out in a faux leather skirt, some ripped tights and a choker. I turned up with my friend at the O2, but it was only when we were walking up the stairs to our seats that I realised that everybody around me was white. The whole venue was full of industrial metal fans and I struggled to find one person of colour. A few months later, I went to see Marilyn Manson and exactly the same thing happened. A full arena and not a single person of colour in sight. As we left that concert, someone spilled a glass of beer on me. It was most probably an accident, but that small act suddenly made the space unsafe. I didn't go to a mosh pit again after that. Something didn't quite feel right. I started questioning the politics and the race of the musicians. Suddenly I became hyper aware of the alt-right and neo-Nazis and their chosen anthems, all metal. My love for the music eventually died down, yet the aesthetic stayed. I tried hard to find punk and rock bands that had people of colour in them, particularly Desis, but it seemed like punk wasn't something Desis did. And then I came across the Caminas. The Caminas did for me what those first CDs from Charlotte had done. They provided me with a safe space to be Desi and Muslim and punk, 
to be able to swear and scream and headbang. The Caminas allowed me back into the punk and rock spheres without feeling like I was sympathising with the alt-right. The only problem was that they were based in the United States. I couldn't find a community here in Manchester. I moved back in with my parents and had to tone down my rock chick look massively. None of my desi friends were into it. They didn't really get why I wanted to shave my head or understand the appeal of a scaffold piercing. My ripped denim jeans were replaced with kurtas, my leather chains and cuffs with gold bangles. <clears throat> in the mainstream, we started seeing desi influencers and models. Sari inspired clothing and bindis made their way through hipster clubs and festivals and into fashion weeks. I didn't have time to mourn the loss of the leather. I had a new obsession. My mother was happier seeing me in culturally appropriate clothing. I quickly got bored of the femme look and tried to switch it up, wearing short kurtas with jeans and baggy shalvaras with normal t-shirts. It didn't go down too well. For some reason, when white girls did it, it was fashion. But when I did it, I looked like I'd forgotten half the outfit at home. I didn't understand how yoga pants and casually worn bindis had suddenly become a fashion statement for others, but gave me high school freshy flashbacks when I wore them. I yearned for the time when I could just wear leather skirts and chokers and instantly feel part of the community. I also miss listening to metal. I fell, in a, I fell in and out of love with people who introduced me to other genres of music, but I could never recreate the feeling I got when I listened to metal. I had a brief moment of listening to Pangra and then to Afrobeat, but found that I was always looking for heavy beats and something to zone out to. I started going to Muslim matchmaking events, but ultimately had to make a choice. I could either embrace my half punk, half desi self and try and explain all of that in the space of two minutes, or I could drop one of them. It was always easier to drop one. I knew the cultured and desi version of myself would be more accepted in those spaces. So I put the leather jacket back in the closet. The matchmaking never amounted to anything. The events were great for anecdotes to tell at parties, but nothing else. Even with my cultured desi self, I still was not right for those events or those spaces. I just didn't fit in. It's a shame it took me a while to figure that one out. A few months ago, I found a suitcase containing my old leather skirts, corsets and rip tights. I tried on my leather jacket, found that it didn't fit. I'd outgrown it. Perhaps because of the lockdown or perhaps it was known that the Andes will always side-eye me, I ordered a new jacket and a pair of junky, chunky Doc Martens and called a friend to shave my head. As a teen, I used to dream of starting my own desi punk band. Maybe I'll call it The Real Freshies. Maybe I'll bump into a few desis who love headbanging and wearing baggy shalvaras as much as I do. And maybe we'll start a band together. In the meantime, I'll keep listening to the Caminas on repeat and hiding my undercut from my mum. It's really interesting um, in talking about memory in general, because Catherine, your piece is more about holiday memories and sort of just being with your family. But again, those memories still resonate with how you feel today sometimes. So tell us why that particular memory. I, I think the, the thing with the donkeys. So I lived in North London. We lived in a terraced house. I'm not going to ride horses you know this was uh, but it was the donkeys that I fell in love with and then in in Wales I did have families who worked in you know in the countryside so I did get on horses more than any London normal you know well poor ordinary kid but it was the donkeys uh, and you know I, I would just spend all day with the donkeys the smell of them the touch of them and my life has sort of circled back. I mean, my day job is I do a lot of writing for children, but also I, I now live on my own. And I have a pony on loan, which means I go and look after it. Through lockdown, I've been going and shoveling shit. I am 14. Um, and, and actually the things that I'm writing about in this story have come full circle because I went to a very strange party two Saturdays ago, strange in that it's out of my normal world because it was horse people and the day after the friend I didn't know anybody there there was all tangential because of pony I live in outside Hastings it's different having a pony here although I did have a pony in Hackney in the city farm it's a long story 
Anyway, so uh, she said to me, and I was the only woman of color there, apart from the Tina Turner tribute act, who was working. And my friend said to me, she said, oh, they all really liked you. I said, really, you know, yeah, they really liked your tan, really, you know, it's like, that's the color I want. It's like white, not quite. It, it's, I am the acceptable, I am the acceptable shade of brown. I am the acceptable mixed raceness. Uh, it's always been, I'm never, never black enough, never, it's all that. And I know everybody's identity is, and everybody has problems with identity. And I'm lucky in one way, I've got a peg to hang anything on, but it is funny. It's like, if there was a shade chart, I am the color a lot of white women would like to be. Yeah. Even um, if it doesn't, you know, it's, it's so all these things, the horses, the ponies, the donkeys, the, the, and the fact that I would have done anything. I mean, I did, I knew there was something off in the way he was treating me, but I didn't know what it was. I couldn't articulate it at the time, the donkey man. Um, and the, the sullen boy, but I didn't care because I would have done anything, done anything just to be near those animals. I have a charmed life. I was born not long after the midpoint of the 20th century where children went everywhere on their own. I spent long days on the covered reservoir or playing over the allotments or in the gardens of derelict houses, in places where the grass was so long you could make dens and no one would know you were there. My parents were warned not to have children. We would be, at the very least, mad. It was unfair. We'd not be one thing or the other. No one would want us, not white people, not black people. We'd be confused. But mum said, isn't everyone? My mum loved showing me off. She dressed me in white and yellow. She cut my hair short so she didn't have to brush it. And both my parents made me feel I was more than good enough. At home, the world was at my feet. And I'm definitely the glass half full sort of woman. The universe has been kind. I've been blessed so far with health, symmetrical features and a dollop of good luck. I may no longer be a marriageable woman, but I'm happy in my skin. I'm light-skinned brown, the sort of brown that screams citizen of everywhere or nowhere. A high yellow woman with good hair, the sort of hair, the sort of curls that elderly women who like perms admire. An acceptable shade of tan. People, white people, stop me in the street, lean over in the train, or they did in the before times, and tell me what a lovely colour I am, just the shade they like. Once, the year before last summer, I was driving at a T-junction, Arm along the sill, the window sill, when two women staggered off a bus, vodka bottles in hand. They lurched towards me in a drunken run. I wished for a gap in the traffic, none, to chance to pull away. None came. The first woman to reach me leaned down, her arm on my arm, grinning like she discovered cold fusion or perpetual motion. This colour, see! She looked from me to our arms, brown skin against white, to her mate hurrying to catch up. That's the colour I want. I did not flinch. I knew not to. I kept a sort of smile on my face and drove away as soon as I could. Half funny, half odd, half in that moment when I clocked the two of them drunken and closing in. Scary. And that sums it up, really. Every reaction, every interaction... I think it's about keeping your face straight, making sure your cast iron heart is mostly impervious and hoping that glass half full doesn't get smashed in your face. Of course, I'm so much more of what people want than my parents were. No one has refused me a flat or a home. No one has told me not to marry whoever or not allowed me access to contraception. I have one of those faces that could be anything. Whatever you project. Israeli, Moroccan, Tahitian, Javan, everything or nothing. And now, at my age, in these times, it's easier. I present as nice, middle-class, grey-haired divorcee, likes ponies, swimming, knitting, cinema, good food, wine sometimes. I know who I am now, and I've taken to calling myself English. Both parents would be very upset at this. But surely that's what I am. I'm not a Londoner anymore. I live in Hastings. I'm thoroughly 
entirely to the tips of my fingers, one of the Angle folk. A sister through time to Beachy Head woman across the bay in Eastbourne. Here to stay, even if I'm not quite what anyone wants. But then, this morning, well, when I wrote this last, when the pools were open, it happened again. I've spoken to this man before, a fellow swimmer, about not putting on the it ain't half hot mum Indian accent when he speaks to me, but clearly enjoys it, wants a reaction perhaps. My face is blank, but inside it's 1969 all over again. I must be seven or eight. I'm on the beach at Pensar, North Wales, and my mum and her sister are somewhere further down, eat, talking and talking fast in English and Welsh eating lion's jersey cream slices, ersatz cream, flaky pastry, faint gritty dusting of sand. Out on the mauve sea, big boats on the horizon plough up and down between Liverpool and everywhere else. I am up away from the sea, away from my mum. We're up where the road runs into the pebbly, sandy, nothingy beach from town to where the donkeys are. There is a donkey man, flat-capped, screw-faced from lack of teeth and a lifetime of squinting. And a donkey boy, browned by the sun, not genetics, and wearing, I think, I'm sure, a kind of ink-blue, bri-nylon turtleneck, whatever the weather. I am wrapped. It is love. Those big eyes, those long ears, the velvety, velvety noses. The hooves, the fur, the smell, even the saddles and bridles. Ancient leather, brow bands with their names painted on in old enamel paint in seasidey colours. Flash, smoky, rosy. I'm there all the time, every time, every visit. How much is a ride? Sixpence, I think. But I could be wrong. And when the sixpences are done, I hang around. I hang around so much that sometimes, if there are a lot of punters, I get to lead the little ones across the top of the beach. And it makes me feel, I think, the way a king might. The donkey man calls me coffee. He shouts it down the beach. Hey, coffee! It's not my name, but I don't correct him. I am not stupid. I am not rocking this four-legged boat. We're doing a very short but sweet conversation today. Um, and I just wanted to ask, given you've all reflected on aspects of your childhood, um, if there is one thing that you could tell your childhood self and, um, you know, to reassure or to make happy or whatever, what would that one thing be that you know now that you could share with your childhood self? Um, Afshan, let's start with you. Um, that soundproofing headphones get better as you get older and nobody can hear what you're listening to anyway, so it doesn't matter. Go ahead and rock away to some old school Bollywood. Why not? <laughs> what about you, Jay? What would you tell your, your younger self? I would say that you've already kind of got it worked out for your instincts. Nothing external will ever make you happy. Catherine, what about you? What would you tell you? Um, I would tell my younger self not to be so grateful for the crumbs, not to put up with so much just to sniff the donkey, which again, it's, I think has been the bane of my entire life and my relationship with my work is I've been too grateful. And John, what about you? What would you tell your younger self? Well, I didn't think I could dance in that disco, but uh, I could if I let myself. I saw, come on, dance, mate. And I hope you carry on. You're just dancing now, John. You know, every day, <laughs> just to show that that's the case. <laughs> it's really been. Um, it's when I sent the brief out to all of you about not quite right for us in you know whatever way you wanted to depict that it was so lovely to get such a range of different types of remembrance but which also kind of meet each other 
And um, I wondered, just as a sort of ad hoc question, if there was another piece that you might have read in the book that kind of you felt really resonated with you, um, was there anything in particular that kind of reminded you of, you know, something else that you'd experienced or that you just really enjoyed? I, I'm really, I'm really up, not upset, sad that Zalu's not here because I love her writing and I loved her piece. And in fact, you know, that was one of the pieces I went to. Um, I think it's so, it's so, it's like, you, you know, what, what's great about writing, anybody's writing, is getting a window. It's like, what? sorry, I'm pointing. You can't see me pointing. <laughs> John, but you know, you're saying about the bungalow with the windows, writing is like, you know, you walk past someone's house and you get a look in through the windows at another life. And I think that's what I like about her piece and about a lot of, well, about any good writing is, is just looking through the windows and seeing a moment in their lives as you walk past. And uh, I think hers was very effective for that. So even so, she's not here. I'm fangirling her. In this discussion, it's been really, really lovely to have this. And Jay, when you, what was the phrase you used? Was it emotional? You said was it? You you used the phrase emotional something, emotional learning. What was the phrase you used? Emotional literacy. That's so brilliant. I'd never heard that phrase before. I've heard the phrase emotional intelligence, but that's a really. Um, it's a it's a important I mean it's I suppose it was something that I didn't real, realize at school as, as I say I've got these books now and obviously that's not emotional literacy but it's the same sort of thing and we didn't have access to that and I think it's really good to have this discussion because it makes me realize it's an important thing and it's uh, we are writers and we do take our we take our words and our books in but hopefully we also take in a wider literacy I mean, I would just say that actually, um, you know, I used to be really ashamed of coming from Croydon or living in Croydon. I used to always sort of, and um, John, I remember you doing your poem about your loot and bungalow. <laughs> it's like a funny one. It's like a song and our loot and bungalow. Um, when I was at, uh, Battersea Arts Centre many years ago and I do think about that as like a way of I know that you're, you're kind of being tongue-in-cheek about it but um, I do see it as a kind of point at which I kind of started to think oh actually you can come from Greg's places and have <laughs> some pride even if it's human maybe or whatever you know what I mean like it, you can you can act there's actually a lot to be found and to be gleaned um, from really looking at your 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 own material circumstances first, you know, before you kind of envy other people's. So, yeah, thank you for that. I'll sing you my song about Croydon, the Croydon Library sometime. I've got one. Um, Afshan, just to ask you if there was any piece that you wanted to talk about or that resonated. Yeah, um, just to say, when I got the brief, I really struggled because I thought I've not fit in every point of my life, what do I write about? Um, and when I got the book and I, I went straight to, to Jay's poems, sorry to embarrass you Jay, because I, I love your poetry and I've seen them before and I was like, okay, this is really great. Um, and as I was flicking through, I realized I was like, oh my God, I could write about this. Oh my God, I could have written about this. Oh my God, I could, and every single point I was like, I resonated with something in everybody's piece. And I think it, it's so weird because there's so much a range of experiences throughout the entire, entire anthology, but there's that shared experience of not fitting in that we all resonate with. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that, that um, actually there were a lot of pieces within it and I was jealous that I didn't kind of explore that side. I was like, oh my God, I've got a great story about that. Um, and I just wanted to respond to each and every one of them. But yeah. Thank you so much. Finally, let's listen to some of Zhao Lugo's essay. I lived most of my life in rural China. Then I left for the West. I was certain when I first opened the pages 
of Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. Growing up in a small village, my early childhood was about scavenging for food in a harsh environment. If there was a wonderland in my dream then, there was a food wonderland with pork dumpling filled ponds to swim in and beef noodle bears to sleep on. We didn't have the luxury of children's literature or television to occupy our minds. In the 1970s and 80s, the legacy of the Cultural Revolution still permeated the Chinese society. That bitter ideological wind has swept away all fairies and fairy toys. Snow White never appeared in any theater, nor the singing mermaids of Neverland. There were the opium of Western bourgeois society, instruments to narcotize children's minds. Now I realize that, from a Western point of view, I barely had a childhood. No one in 1960s and 70s China did. There was only propaganda for kids, forging an anti-Western and anti-feudal spirit. And it got worse too. Teenage years came with burden of school studies. Outside the class, we had to absorb the lessons of the October Revolution by cramming Balkov's white guards or stories about the Yugoslav leader Tito's boyhood. Or we would learn facts about the French Revolution and how the heads of the King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had been chopped off. Apart from studying, there was always more studying, no time to play, so no adolescence either. Such were my early years. My mind, like those of my peers, was flattened by communist dogma. And then one morning, like cattle on a day of slaughter, we all awakened to a fevered capitalist hell and burning alive in it, down with English American imperialism. Suddenly appeared sarcastically as an opening line in a natively produced rock and roll song. And one spring morning in 1994, I chanted those lines to myself while rushing to a newly opened computer store in Beijing. I queued with thousands of young people in order to buy first generation PC and only to be told that all sold out. I sang the rock and roll song again, down with English American imperialists. We are not afraid of paper tigers and materialism. Was this political rage or simply my own frustration against the computer industry? It felt to me that my generation was required to swallow one big contradiction. The state wanted us to talk the talk of socialism, but walk the walk of capitalism. Decades later, center stage of the old capitalist world, England, I give birth to my child in the East London hospital. Even before the baby had managed to open her eyes, we had already received an ample supply of toys and music boxes and the coloring books. So I am, I realize, a childless woman with a child in her arms. How will I ever be able to explain my history to this little girl? Now I have begun learning what a Western childhood might look like. Here in central London, we have free music classes for babies, not only in nurseries, but also in libraries and in parks. We have play dates with kids dressed up as a Batman, tiny tumble sessions almost every weekend. And every Monday, there's a baby yoga and every Wednesday, baby screening. When the days get darker and colder, children are promised Halloween parties, Christmas carol concerts, and presents from Santa Claus. And in the summer, a beach holiday, if the family has a good income, and so on. It's a paradise, no, or near paradise, compared with kids in some other countries. Babyhood here is like a never ending summer camp for young folk with eternal sunny afternoons. Two weeks after my child's birth, we were queuing at the town hall to register as a British citizen. 
while waiting amongst many new booms and new parents. I opened a random page of Alice Adventures in Wonderland and I read, curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that for the moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. I began to wonder if there was any Chinese story vaguely resembling Louis Carroll's. I went online and discovered a 1928 novel called Alice Adventures in China, written by one of our most renowned writers, Shen Wan. I immediately began reading the online version. Shen's Alice takes trip to China with her white rabbit in a political satire of the war ravaged country. As I scanned the pages, I found the text heavy. The dialogue between the innocent Alice and the Chinese peasants was totally rhetorical, choked with hardship and misery. Every character cried for social justice and an unavoidable revolution, including the rabbit. The book flopped, according to historians. I have to admit, though, that Alice's adventure in China are much more absurd than her journey down the rabbit hole, if absurdity is a necessary quality for children's literature. It seems self-evident that childhood is manufactured both in the East and the West. Childhood in the West today is like a children's television channel, despite the fun and innocence. It is still nevertheless embedded in the systematic production of a consumer society. When I see and feel this commercial force permeating every corner of children's lives here, I ask, is it actually better to be without a so-called childhood? When I voiced this thought to an English friend, she scoffed at such an absurd notion. Okay, but I felt stifled by my secret status being an adult without childhood. Thinking back, one of the Chinese children's idols I grew up, grew up with was a young soldier named Lei Feng of the People's Liberation Army. He died when he was 21 always wearing an army uniform and carrying a rifle. For the last 50 years, he has beamed forth from propaganda posters, surrounded by slogans such as, follow Leifen's example, love the party, love socialism, love the people. And from our earliest school days, we learned how selfless Leifen had been and how he had dedicated every single minute of his life to the greater good. Well, that was our primary education, to learn to be entirely selfless without vanity and not to be daydreamers. In the 1960s, Leifen's diary was first presented to the public by Lin Biao, then vice chairman of the Chinese Communist Party in the learn from Leifen campaigns. The diary was full of accounts of Lei's admiration for Mao Zedong and his self-sacrificing deeds and his desire to foment revolutionary spirit. The campaign lasted till the mid 1990s. But Times Arrow has not brought us a new living life in any form. The eternal fire of Leifen's communist spirit has cooled somewhat in early 21st century China. Indeed, it has become digital in 2006, a Chinese organization released a video game titled Learn From Leifen Online, in which the player has to perform good deeds, fight spies, and amass objects from Mao Zedong's collection. And if the player wins, their character gets to meet Mao. It looks like a postmodern joke, but not in China's self-transforming new spirit. Thank you.